Edward, Duke of Windsor, was a man who has obsessed historians and journalists for decades. As King Edward VIII, he reigned for just 326 days before abdicating in disgrace. Best known for his affair and subsequent marriage to Wallace Simpson, history records him as one of the great romantics, a man who sacrificed his throne and prestige for love. As a couple, the Windsors dominated gossip columns and society parties, epitomizing a gilded existence for many adoring British subjects. Over 20 years after Edward's death, this idealized legend is still the authorized version. But the romantic headlines and romanticized biographies have concealed darker truths about Edward. Evidence has now emerged that he passed national secrets to foreign governments of his complicity with Adolf Hitler and of illegal financial dealings which netted him millions of pounds. The royal family and successive British governments have done everything to prevent this information about Edward being made public. Edward was born in 1894. The eldest son in a family of six, his upbringing conformed to the strict discipline of Victorian conventions. An autocratic and remote father left him in the unhappy care of nannies and servants. In 1910, his parents became King and Queen of England. George V and Queen Mary granted Edward the title of the Prince of Wales. Throughout his life, Edward had an abiding love for all things German. The royal family's name, Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, reflected their German roots. His mother was a German princess, and the young prince spent many happy holidays there. Edward had a natural sympathy with Germany. He'd been there as a young man. He had close friends and relations there. And it was his favorite language. I think it was the only foreign language that he spoke well. The outbreak of war in 1914 threw the heir to the throne into crisis. Edward served in the Grenadier Guards, but was prohibited from fighting in the front line. It was a war between the two countries which formed his heritage. Twenty years on, this conflict of loyalties would prove to be his undoing. After the war, Edward was used to promote the monarchy internationally. For most of the 20s, he toured the British Empire as a roving ambassador. Handsome and fashionable, the Prince of Wales was fated everywhere he went. Everybody thought he was marvellous. He was good looking. There appeared to be no sort of strain on his character or his performance at all. He'd done very well on the Western Front, everybody said. Everyone thought that he was going to be marvellous. It turned out not to be so, but then only the inner circle knew that it was likely not to turn out to be so. But there was another side to the prince's character. He hated the stuffy rituals of monarchy and frequently dodged his duties to have affairs, usually with married women. None of these indiscretions was ever reported in the press, but his loyal retainers were expected to cover up for him as they would throughout his life. His behavior infuriated his private secretary, Alan Lassels, who wrote to his wife, I can't help thinking that the best thing that could happen to him and to the country would be for him to break his neck. Relations between the two men broke down completely on a tour of Kenya. George V had fallen seriously ill, his life was at risk. But Edward refused to return to Britain. Lassels wrote, Then for the first and only time in our association, I lost my temper with him. Sir, I said, the King of England is dying. And if that means nothing to you, it means a great deal to us. He looked at me without a word and spent the remainder of the evening in the successful seduction of a Mrs. Barnes, wife of the local commissioner. 
But Edward changed his philandering ways when he met Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee. In the early 1930s, they fell madly in love. Outspoken and ambitious, she represented the opposite of everything Edward had been brought up with. I have never known, in the course of a long life, one person so utterly possessed by another as he was by her. She, she, it wasn't domination, it was a form of possession. Uh, yes, it was very, very remarkable. And she was, in my opinion, the great nanny of all time. She was a nanny. For King George and his courtiers, she was unsuitable on every count. She was twice married and in the throes of a second divorce. She was American and deemed ignorant of court ways. The thought of a divorced foreigner as queen was too terrible to contemplate. But more pressing matters were at hand. In 1933, Hitler's Nazi party swept to power on a platform of radical social reform. Edward greatly admired Hitler's programs to counter mass unemployment. He believed that Hitler had worked an economic miracle pulling Germany out of the Great Depression and stated publicly that Britain should offer them the hand of friendship. His father, George V, was furious. He accused Edward of unconstitutional behavior by intervening in foreign affairs and making pro-German statements. When Hitler came to power, he approved of Hitler. He was, I'm afraid, a natural fascist. He was the sort of person who thought it was all right if the trains ran on time. And I think he was heard to refer to his own country and probably France as slip-shod democracies which shows where his sympathies lay, I think. London is hushed, and all over the world, countless millions are waiting to take part in spirit in the last journey of His Majesty King George V, away from the crowds and turmoil of his capital. In January 1936, George V died, and Edward succeeded to the throne. The wayward prince was to become a wayward monarch. Before he died, his father had predicted to Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, After I am dead, the boy will ruin himself within 12 months. Even at the proclamation of Edward as king, he seemed determined to tear up the rule book. He defied protocol, and watched part of the ceremony with his mistress by his side. He soon gathered a new breed of courtier around him. Among them was his cousin, Charles, Duke of Saxe-Coburg. An old Etonian and a senior Nazi officer, he caused outrage at the king's funeral by wearing his Nazi uniform. Even before George V had died, Saxe Coburg had introduced himself as Hitler's emissary and stated he would do everything possible to open up direct and private lines of communication between the new king and Hitler. Saxe Coburg gave his impressions of Edward to Hitler in a secret message. King Edward is resolved to concentrate the business of government on himself. Saxe Coburg went on to say that Edward wanted to talk in person to Hitler. The dangers of the king going behind his government's back were to become immediately apparent. In March 1936, Hitler ordered his troops across these bridges into the Rhineland, the demilitarized zone controlled by France since the end of the First World War. His action was in direct breach of all international treaties. It was Hitler's greatest gamble. He believed he risked war. But even at this crucial moment, Hitler knew that the King of England was on his side. 
Edward was closely following developments from his home at Fort Belvedere near Windsor Castle. An extraordinary account of the King's reaction to the events in the Rhineland was left by Fritz Hesse, the press attaché at the German Embassy in London. He reported to Berlin a conversation he had overheard between Edward and the German ambassador in London. Edward said, I sent for the Prime Minister and gave him a piece of my mind. I told the old so-and-so that I would abdicate if he made war. There was a frightful scene, but you needn't worry. There won't be a war. According to Hesse, the German ambassador, Leopold von Hirsch, danced with joy. He said, I have done it. I have outwitted them all. There won't be a war. The king's support was passed on to a grateful Hitler, who had feared an immediate armed response from Britain. Hitler's advance into the Rhineland became the defining moment in the descent to war. And not for the last time, he was influenced by Edward's support. What he did was to let a foreign government know, foreign government with whom his own government was in dispute, uh, that uh, he differed from his government's policy, and that if this came to the crux, he would do his best to make this clear and overrule them. Now that is by any standard of, be of behavior totally unconstitutional. And, and uh, I can't talk of treason in this, but, uh, uh, if it had been done by somebody who was bound by the oath of loyalty to the Crown or the Official Secret Act or anything like that, uh, one can't help feeling that they would have a very dim view would have been taken of them by the authorities. Edward's insistence on asserting himself politically was already causing consternation in government circles. There was great anxiety about the security of cabinet papers going to Fort Belvedere for the King's approval. The new German ambassador, Joachim von Ribbentrop, was frequently visited by Wallace Simpson. The dangers she represented were soon confirmed to Prime Minister Baldwin by one of his cabinet ministers, Sir Walter Runciman. His son recalls the occasion. My father one day had been at a cabinet meeting in the morning. Late in that, that evening, he had to go to a reception where, rather to his annoyance, he found himself having to talk to Ribbentrop, who was then ambassador. And Ribbentrop started telling him, or talking to him, about what the cabinet had been discussing that morning. And it became perfectly clear that Baldwin had, of course, at once told the king of what had been uh, uh, discussed. And so, uh, the King must have told Mrs. Simpson at once, and she'd gone round to the German embassy. By the summer of 1936, many in the establishment thought that Edward's behavior was unacceptable. The couple's pro-German and fascist tendencies were well known in inner circles. The suspicion that they could be leaking cabinet secrets to Berlin was a logical conclusion. Increasingly, Edward was seen as a security risk. The Foreign Office took the dramatic step of withholding sensitive state papers and diplomatic boxes from the monarch. In August 1936, Edward further angered his critics when he set off on a yachting cruise of the Adriatic with Wallace Simpson completely ignoring the advice of the government. Not one word of his affair had been reported in the British press. Elsewhere, it created headlines, with speculation that Edward might even try to make her queen. So far as I can make out, there was a feeling among the old establishment that the king was not being kingly enough, that he was indiscreet in his private conversation as well as in his private life, that he was a rash man with whom to trust any secret that was at all deep, that he 
didn't bother to read his boxes in the way that his father had done. In 1948, Professor M. R. D. Foote was a young student working on a history of the Times newspaper. At the time, he saw an extraordinary file of letters which confirmed that powerful political and even religious figures had been uniting against Edward. It was a three-sided correspondence between Geoffrey Dawson, the editor of the Times, Canon Don of Westminster, who was understood to speak for the Archbishop of Canterbury, and one of the very senior men at the palace, I forget whether Harding or Lassell. And the three of them agreed in the spring, summer of 1936, that as a king, the king wasn't much good. And they, the other two asked Dawson if he would mind sounding out dominion opinion about what the, the dominions thought of the prospect of Mrs. Simpson as queen. They didn't want to go through the dominion office. Dawson was well placed to do this. He had plenty of friends in Canada and some in Australia and in New Zealand, responsible editors who could understand which way public opinion was going, and he sounded them all out and reported back that they were all of one accord that the old dominions wouldn't think of having Mrs. Simpson as queen. And the three decided that this would be, she would provide a good excuse for getting rid of the king. It was not just in the far reaches of the empire that the plotters sought support. In September 1936, the ringleaders met at this country house in Hampshire on the pretext of a shooting party. Their aim was to force the king out. Even Chancellor Neville Chamberlain agreed something had to be done about Edward. I think they were absolutely determined to be rid of him, and I think they found Mrs. Simpson an absolutely marvelous excuse. <laughs> A gift from the gods, um, because they, they wanted to be rid of him. He represented everything they found most inconvenient. And also, uh, they greatly resented his refusal to play ball with uh, what he thought were outdated uh, uh, social conventions. In October 1936, the Simpson divorce came through. While British newspapers were silent, the foreign press predicted that Mrs. Simpson would marry the king within a year. King Edward's romance holds the attention of the world, and in London, the drama of empire unfolds. Crowds like this surround Buckingham Palace to prove to the king that all the world loves a lover. Except perhaps Prime Minister Baldwin, leader of the government's fight against the marriage. Mrs. Simpson was now an additional and pressing reason for the king's removal. But if she was to be the public excuse, the establishment would need more ammunition. There was nothing Edward's critics could legitimately do to prevent him marrying Wallace but they could destroy her reputation. A file known as the China Dossier was cited as proof of her dubious past. It suggested that Wallace enjoyed an exotic sex life as a young married woman in Shanghai in the 1920s. Uh, this uh, wicked document was concocted, uh, forged, if you like, uh, and used to horrify Queen Mary and Mr. Baldwin and other rather um, important uh, 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 and conventional people who would be horrified if they had a story of um, very peculiar doings by a young woman in China. And of course the allegations were in it were absolutely horrifying. What were they? Oh, well, the, 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 she, she had deliberately learned from uh, experienced prostitutes in China uh, various uh, sexual uh, um, methods, or whatever you like to call it, which which uh, hotted up the male species, um, and especially males who weren't perhaps uh, as vigorous as they might wish, um, uh, and that, uh, that she'd frequented uh, Chinese bottles and thoroughly enjoyed it all, and that it had been her her, 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 her metier, and etc., etc. I mean, very unpleasant. While rumors of the existence of this controversial file have existed for many years, 
It's now widely accepted that the allegations in it were inventions. What is significant is that the establishment needed to sink to these depths to stop Edward. For 60 years, the enduring notion has been that the only reason for Edward's downfall was his love for Mrs. Simpson. But this was the final straw for the establishment. The truth is that Edward's unacceptable political beliefs and willful actions were the key reasons for his removal. Prime Minister Baldwin finally raised the question of the King's abdication when he coldly informed Edward that Wallace, as Queen, would be unacceptable to his government, the opposition, and the British Empire. Edward proposed a last-minute compromise, with Wallace relinquishing all hereditary claims. It was rejected. On December the 12th, Edward gave in and announced his abdication. At long last, I am able to say a few words of my own, that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do, without the help and support of the woman I love. Edward concluded his speech by telling his subjects that he would be retiring from public life. Driven into exile and humiliated, his claim that he was withdrawing from the public stage was to ring hollow in the coming months. The ex-king and his fiancée settled in France, and in June 1937 they married at the Chateau de Condé in the Loire Valley. Edward's brother, King George VI, had issued strict instructions that no member of the royal family was to attend the wedding. But one thing more than anything else upset Edward. The new king had granted Edward the rank of Duke of Windsor, but had declared that Wallace Simpson could not be called Her Royal Highness. Her title would be merely the Duchess of Windsor. Edward's equerry, Dudley Forward, was given the unenviable task of informing the Duke of this royal edict immediately after his wedding. When His Royal Highness was changing to go away, the opportunity arose when I had to inform him. And I suppose it was one of the most difficult and unhappy moments in my life, because it literally broke his heart. She, to him, was perfect, perfect. And anything that was denied her was uh, not only an insult to her, but an insult to him. And he was sh 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 shattered by it. Edward would never forgive his brother for this insult. As the newlyweds drove away on honeymoon, he now felt free to say and do what he liked. He found a kindred spirit in the industrial tycoon, Charles Beddoe. The millionaire had lent the couple his chateau for their wedding. But Beddoe had more sinister ambitions. Although he shared French and American nationality, Beddoe was a powerful supporter of the Third Reich. He was to become an economic advisor for Hitler in Vichy, France, and was eventually arrested for treason by the Americans. Beddoe saw Edward as a useful ally and began scheming. He even attempted to recruit the Duke's equity to the Nazi cause. He came to, to England, stayed at Claridge's. He telephoned me and asked if I'd go and dine with him. And he said, if you play it our way, I will see that you will benefit from it. I think that he uh, was close uh, to uh, Nazi Germany. And uh, he may well have been sent over uh, at that time. He, he could he remember he was a he was a Frenchman, so he was able to come to to London. But I suspect I've got no proof that he was deeply involved in the German war effort. Beddo recruited another highly placed Nazi sympathizer in his plan to manipulate Edward. He introduced the Swedish millionaire 
Axel Venegren to the Duke. Venegren was one of the richest men in the world and a major arms dealer. He was close to Hermann Goering and was to play a key role in the Windsor story. Until recently, the official version has been that Edward did not meet Venegren until 1940. But we have discovered they met much earlier, here in Paris in 1937. The Swede visited Edward at his hotel. Working under instructions from Berlin, he and Beddo extended an invitation from the Führer himself for Edward to visit Germany. The Duke and Duchess were to be Hitler's personal guests. If the British establishment thought that Edward had truly retired from public life, the news of his trip was a rude reminder that he still had political aspirations. Well, when the um, royal family and indeed the British government found out that Edward planned this trip to Germany, which he had not told them about, they were horrified. From one point of view, it seemed to them to indicate that he was trying to get back center stage and take the limelight. And for another, it was interference in foreign policy to, at a particularly difficult moment. Undeterred by a barrage of international criticism, the Duke and Duchess were triumphantly received at Berlin's Friedrichstrasse station. The lure of the political stage proved too great for Edward to resist. He was playing straight into Hitler's hands, who trumpeted the trip as an unofficial state visit designed to promote an agreement between England and Germany. Dudley Forward accompanied the Duke throughout the tour. The uh, concert consisted of classical music and terminated uh, by them playing the national anthem, followed by the, the German. And there I am indeed as a very young man. The press interest as to whether or not the Duke would follow the example of the Nazis and seize their salute was quite amusing. I think he went for two reasons. One was that he hadn't appreciated that he was no longer a national figure a man of importance, a man whose views could sway people. And therefore he hoped, because he'd never recovered from his hate of war in the First World War, that he could persuade Hitler to stop his uh, warlike attitude. Secondly, he had this great worship of his wife, and I think he longed for her to be shown enormous amount of flattery. But we now know that this was only part of Edward's objective in going to Germany. The idea was that the ex-king could be the figurehead of an international movement for peace on Hitler's terms. This had been encouraged by Charles Bedo in Paris. They even planned to send Edward to the United States with his message of appeasement. Beddo cabled his old friend, Axel Venegren, in Paris, soon after Edward's arrival. Your friend Windsor made an exceptionally sympathetic impression. Delighted to cooperate, but we must be exceedingly careful. We'll submit plan later. The scheme to shift popular opinion in Hitler's favor was spelt out when Edward visited the deputy Führer, Rudolf Hess, at his home. His son, Wolf Rudiger Hess, talked at length with his father about the Windsor's visit. We've got here the visitor's book of my father, showing all the visitors which uh, saw him starting on the 9th of May, 1936. We have here, uh, we got him from Rippentrop, his wife, and the two Wiets, which were Swedish uh, people. We have here Adolf Hitler, 17th of May, 1936. Several times Adolf Hitler. And we have uh, here the Duke and the Duchess of Windsor at the 22nd of October 19, 
37, he signed it with a German, he wrote Herzog von Winsor, and uh, the Duchess wrote Herzogin von Winsor, which is a German translation for Duke and Duchess. To my, my knowledge, uh, my father met the Duke and Duchess of Windsor two times, one time officially here in Munich, the evening before the Duke went to uh, practice garden and saw Hitler, and then there was a second time when he had a private invitation at my father's home here in Munich. My mother told me that uh, they went to the cellar and when they came back they were both very excited. And my mother took from this that they understood themselves quite well in discussing, of course, politics. For example, both were anti-communists, to mention one thing. The Duke of Windsor definitely was a, an imperialist, talking to the, about the British Empire, and uh, he saw that uh, the question was not any more of the balance of power in Europe, it was a question of the balance of power in in the world, which Churchill obviously didn't understand. The negotiated peace, which Edward and Rudolf Hess were so interested in exploring, was based on the new world order. The armies of the Third Reich would have a free reign in Europe, while Britain would be appeased by keeping control of her empire. Hess even offered Edward German troops to quell a colonial rebellion if necessary. Critically, America would be forced to stay out of Europe's affairs. But for Edward, the greatest prize was the promise of a glorious return to the British throne. In my father and Hitler's view, uh, I think uh, if uh, there would have been an agreement, uh, part of the agreement would have been that the Duke of Windsor would have been reinstalled as uh, uh, King Edward VIII, uh, because uh, he had the same views. Same views as? Same political views regarding the world. Same views as your father and as, as Adolf Hitler. Hitler. Yes. Yes. Edward visited the SS training school at Crossensee and was also shown concentration camps. Although the full horror of the Holocaust was yet to come, the camps were already constructed and full of political prisoners, some of them Jewish. Behind the scenes, they had already started murdering people. But I think it is true to say, and uh, I say with my hand on my heart, that uh, neither I myself or indeed uh, the Duke of Windsor realized the slaughter that was taking place. We even went to a concentration and there we saw the prisoners. Concentration camp? Yes. But we never, never realized for a moment that this mass murder was taking place. The Duke and Duchess finally set off to meet their host, Adolf Hitler, at his mountain retreat in Berchtesgaden. It was the climax of their tour, and the Fuhrer was effusive in his welcome. obviously all smiles very pleased to have um, what he thought was possibly a pawn in his hands to have somebody that he could make uh, the uh, the people in England enraged over uh, Hitler showed great respect and politeness and welcoming to the Duke of Windsor, he came outside both to receive us and to say goodbye. The dictator was only too pleased to pay his respects. He was especially impressed by Wallace Simpson. She would have made a good queen, he said. Reports of Edward's escapades in Germany produced outrage within the British establishment. It was perceived as a self-serving publicity stunt by the Duke in favor of appeasing Hitler. All newspaper reports of his trip were censored. But this was not the case in the United States. This was due to be the next destination for the Duke to promote his message of a negotiated peace. President Roosevelt insisted that the visit was called off. Roosevelt's suspicions about Edward's misguided adventures had been raised in the secret State Department report.
which we found locked away in the University of Delaware. In June 1937, George Messersmith was a young American diplomat in Vienna when he met the Windsors at an official dinner. Believing that he was speaking in confidence, Messersmith revealed to the Duke that a train carrying an illicit cargo of naval munitions from Germany to Italy had just crashed in Austria. This disclosure was top secret because it revealed that American intelligence agents had broken secret Italian military ciphers. Nonetheless, the Duke betrayed Messer Smith's secret to an Italian diplomat at the dinner party. A shame-faced Messer Smith reported the devastating leak back to Roosevelt, confirming the president's worst fears. As Hitler escalated his aggression, Edward's behavior raised serious questions. Was it naive folly or calculated treason? In the spring of 1939, Edward again showed his appetite for meddling in international affairs. In a direct attempt to influence American popular opinion, the exiled Duke made a radio broadcast. His message was world peace, but this could only be peace on Hitler's terms. With England and Germany on a collision course, Edward clung to his improbable formula for appeasement, which he had planned with the Nazis. He chose a symbolic location from which to make the broadcast, the ancient French town of Verdun, scene of one of the fiercest battles of the First World War, where over half a million men had died. I am speaking tonight from Verdun, and as I talk to you from this historic place, I am deeply conscious of the presence of the great company of the day. I speak simply as a soldier of the last war. The supreme importance of averting war will, I feel confident, impel all those in power to renew their endeavors to bring about a peaceful settlement. Although the broadcast was never heard in Britain due to pressure from the royal family, in the United States, the Duke's words had enormous impact. Edward remained a law unto himself, ignoring the best interests of his countrymen. The speech Edward gave at Verdun shows how far he was out of touch with the way in which opinion had developed in Britain after Munich. And indeed, the evidence suggests that it had already begun to swing very heavily against Hitler before Christmas 38. Uh, um, one of the important elements in this being the, the lengthy discussion of where he was going to strike next. The other being the anti-Jewish pogrom of November, early November 1938. It shows really that uh, uh, Edward had already lost touch with the way in which opinion was moving among the bulk of the English people. While Edward urged the politicians to sue for peace, the British people had realized that war was inevitable. Many wondered what would have happened had Edward remained king. But few anticipated that he would betray national interests at a time when his country needed it most. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. With the outbreak of war, the question of what to do with the ex-king was still unresolved. His brother, George VI, 
was determined to keep him out of harm's way. Edward was still regarded as a political liability in Britain. So Major General the Duke of Windsor is taking up his appointment with the general staff somewhere in France. Disappointed by his lowly rank, Edward never moved into his military billet and instead spent his time in the more comfortable and familiar surroundings of the best hotels in Paris. The Duke began socializing again with his old pro-Nazi circle led by Charles Bedeau. The Nazi sympathizer found Edward a rich source of information and preyed on his weaknesses. They met almost daily, with Bedeau usually picking up the Duke's hotel bills. I think Edward was generally regarded as a security risk because he used to blab. And he used to drink a lot. And at that time, he certainly couldn't be trusted to keep secrets. And in fact, later on, in the early years of the war, he did give things away which he should not have. There have long been rumors that Edward passed on secrets to the Nazis during his sojourn in Paris. His treachery is proved by a detailed inspection of the German foreign policy documents of the Second World War, which are kept here in Bonn. A seemingly innocuous cable from Germany's ambassador to The Hague, Count Julius von Zeck Berkersroder, reveals how the Nazi hierarchy regarded Edward. Through personal relationships, I might have the opportunity to establish certain lines leading to the Duke of Windsor. He does not feel entirely satisfied with his position. There seems to be something of a resistance movement forming around Windsor which at some time, under favorable circumstances, might acquire certain significance. The fact that he mentions the Duke of Windsor and direct lines to him suggests that he had a source. The source, when you look at the uh, people in the Duke circle who were traveling backwards and forwards to The Hague, uh, the obvious one is Charles Badeau. I mean, we don't get the report from the German ambassador in Paris. It's the German ambassador in The Hague. Bedo was traveling backwards and forwards. We know that from the, um, uh, the, the diaries of the people around them at the time. He was dining with the Duke of Windsor, picking up the tab at the Ritz Hotel. And uh, clearly, he is the most obvious candidate for the source that uh, the German ambassador in The Hague was referring to. Even though he was a serving officer in wartime, there was little doubt that the Duke was prone to careless talk. But in 1940, he went beyond indiscretion in an incident which proved how dangerous Edward could be to the Allied cause. In January 1940, as Hitler prepared for all-out war, he had three clear options to advance through Western Europe. One option was to launch an attack through the lowlands of Belgium and northern France in a rerun of the German tactics in the First World War. Another possibility was an assault much further south through the Maginot Line, the heavily defended system of forts along the French-German border. These were the obvious choices. In between lay the dense forests of the Ardennes, which the Allies believed were impenetrable for rapid army movement. Hitler and the German general staff decided to advance through the Low Countries. The attack was scheduled for January the 17th, and by January the 10th, the armies were on the move. On that day, catastrophe struck for the Germans. A Luftwaffe plane crashed at Mechelen in Belgium, carrying Hitler's complete battle plan. Local resident Alphonse Thies was there when it happened. It was very cold, there was snow everywhere, uh, 15 degrees beneath zero. The, it was a little bit fog over the Mars, over the rain, they lost their way. He came from Mechelen and the Mars, he turned over the border from Holland, he came back, and between two trees he, he broke the two wings of the, of the plane, and then he crashed here in the hedge uh, on the border of the way. Such was the sensitivity of the documents 
that the pilot attempted to destroy the papers before he could be arrested. Then one of the officers tried to burn the papers behind that hedge. The Belgian soldier came from there and arrested him immediately. And then he saw the smoke over the hedge and he arrested the second with the papers also and they brought everything to Mechelen on the Mars. With his troops poised to attack through the Belgian border, Hitler was now confronted with the appalling possibility that his battle plan had fallen into Allied hands. But he could not be sure. He stood down 60 divisions to await intelligence reports. He did not have to wait long. According to the German archives, on the 19th of February, Hitler received this cable from Zeck Berkesroder. The Duke of Windsor has said that the Allied War Council devoted an exhaustive discussion at its last meeting to the situation that would arise if Germany invaded Belgium. Reference was made throughout to a German invasion plan said to have been found in an aeroplane that made a forced landing in Belgium. Astonishingly, the cable went on to spell out the proposed response of the Allies to a German advance through Belgium. This was exactly what Hitler needed to know. Armed with confirmation that his plan had been compromised, Hitler could now be confident that a radically changed plan of attack would succeed. He directed his infantry and tank regiments to attack down these roads through the Ardennes forest, which the Allies had assumed were impassable. This border post was all that stood in their way. Defended by a token force, the German tanks swept all resistance aside. They poured out of the forest and thrust northward in a pincer movement to surprise the British and French forces at Sedan. The evidence offered by the German foreign policy document seems indisputable. Edward had jeopardized his country and the Allies. The German records make it very clear that the Duke was the source of the information. If it was witting, he was a spy and a traitor. If it was unwitting, then at the very least he was careless. And somebody in his position should have known better. The German army stormed through northern France and into Paris in just 35 days. Despite holding military office, Edward reacted to news of the invasion by leaving Paris for his holiday villa in the south of France. For any other serving officer, this would have been a court-martial offence. We don't know whether he had any orders. On the face of it, he should have rejoined his unit, he should have gone back to Britain when the, with, with the rest of the liaison officers when they withdrawn. What he did instead was to correct his wife, dramatically and romantically, and buzz off to the south of France and then via there into Spain and in Portugal. And I cannot help feeling that anybody else would have been, this would have been regarded as desertion uh, in the face of the enemy. I think he simply, as in everything else he did, put himself and his wife ahead of his country and his loyalties and his family, uh, the rest of his family and his brother, the king, and so on. Melancholy fate for the naval might of France. And so it proves. The complete collapse of France follows swiftly. City after city is abandoned without resistance to become a hell on earth. At the outbreak of World War II, Edward was given a military post in Paris. But when German troops invaded northern France in 1940, he turned and ran, firstly to his villa in the south of France and then to Madrid. On the 21st of June, the French signed their armistice agreement with the Germans. Most British people uh, 
were heading for Bordeaux, the Atlantic ports and the Bay of Biscay, which was Vichy France in an attempt to escape where the ships were coming to take them off. What does Windsor do? He heads for Madrid. Spain had, uh, was a potential ally of Hitler's. It was a hotbed of intrigue. And it's astonishing to me that somebody in Windsor's position would decide to go to Spain rather than to head across France, the five-hour drive, to join the rest of the British evacuees at Bordeaux. In the year's darkest hour, Britain achieves a military miracle, the evacuation of Dunkirk. Boatload after boatload embarked on the ceaseless attack. While Britain lived through the darkest days of the war and evacuated her troops from northern France, the Duke and Duchess installed themselves here, in suite 501 of the Ritz Hotel in Madrid. They were warmly welcomed by Franco and his government. Spain was supposedly neutral at this time, but in reality, Franco's regime was firmly in the Nazi camp. Spanish society felt, no doubt, felt the same way about Germany as he did. And I think that he felt he was safe there. And very possibly, he felt that perhaps he might be able to influence course of the war or the course of the peace rather by keeping in touch with the Germans. Over the next two months there was an extraordinary struggle between Hitler and Churchill for the Duke's loyalties. The Nazis were desperate to keep him in Spain so they could negotiate with him directly. Churchill insisted that the couple return to Britain. To buy time Edward made demands he knew were unacceptable to Churchill. He insisted that his wife be accorded the title of Her Royal Highness. The Duke of Windsor was occupying Churchill's time by the making demands, again, about the question of the HRH for the Duchess, and ridiculous details like could he take his um, soldier servant with him um, and excuse him from military duty, which is, again, a pretty shocking thing at that time in the war. And it's unbelievable that Churchill should have to occupy himself with such triviality at a moment like that. Churchill had his hands full. There was a small and potentially dangerous pro-peace movement in England, which was lobbying for negotiations with Hitler. Churchill was determined that the Duke would not become a figurehead for this group. Edward was still convinced that appeasing Hitler was the answer and that the war was a mistake. The Windsors had shown they were prepared to speak out against the British. An extraordinary account of their behavior is recorded by the American ambassador in Madrid, Alexander Weddell. It's Weddell who actually says that there is, quote, an element in England, possibly a growing one, who would find Windsor and his circle a group who are realistic in world politics and who hope to come into their own in time of peace. Now, the language, the realistic, the, is the same language that the Foreign Secretary was using in responding to the initial peace feelers. It, it's the same language, and it's suggesting that Windsor is becoming the focus of the peace uh, process, that Hitler is trying to ram down England's throat. Hitler was not going to risk losing Edward. He ordered his ambassador in Madrid, Eberhard von Stürer, to keep Edward in Spain and under German control at all costs. Von Stürer reported back to Hitler that Edward would only return to Britain under certain conditions. If his wife were recognized as a member of the royal family, and if he were appointed to a military or civilian position of influence. Windsor has expressed himself to the foreign minister in strong terms against Churchill and against this war. In Berlin, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the foreign secretary, advised Hitler to co-opt the man they saw as a friend of Nazi Germany. Documents from the time prove that the dictator planned to reward Edward's loyalty by reinstating him on the British throne when Germany won the war. Ribbentrop was even prepared to offer Edward 50 million Swiss francs to lead a life suitable for a king.
King George VI and Churchill were painfully aware of the threat Edward represented. They were receiving regular bulletins from Madrid through their secret service. It has recently been revealed that Alec Harding, the king's private secretary, wrote a secret memorandum to his master based on intelligence reports from Spain. The Germans' purpose is to form an opposition government under the Duke of Windsor, having first changed public opinion by propaganda. The Germans think King George will abdicate during an attack on London. That report by the palace secretary is an indication the palace were being kept briefed of the extent to which Windsor was treating with the Germans. And we have the German cables uh, which show the extent to which they thought he was playing games with them. So it seems to me that we have two and two here and it makes four. In other words, it makes the Duke of Windsor a traitor. Edward was ordered by Churchill to leave Madrid immediately for Lisbon. From there, he was to make arrangements to proceed home. But Churchill had not predicted with whom the couple would stay. In Portugal, the Windsors were given the loan of the house in Cascais by Ricardo Espiritu Santo, who was a leading banker. Now, the significant thing about this was that he was also a Nazi sympathizer and in touch with the Germans and the German embassy. And um, Windsor very often used to get drunk at dinner parties in, in Kashkash and say some very indiscreet things, which Spiritual Santa would then pass on. Churchill was furious that Edward was stalling for time and also associating with known Nazi sympathizers. He sent a cable reminding Edward of his duties. Your Royal Highness has taken active military rank and refusal to obey direct orders of a competent military authority will create a serious situation. Edward can't have missed the implication. Churchill was threatening the ex-king with court-martial. Even so, Edward chose to ignore the cable and demonstrated how intimate he was with the enemy by seeking the Germans' help on a domestic matter. The Duchess had left some personal effects, linen and silver, at their Paris apartment when they fled south. She now wanted them retrieved and instructed her maid to travel to Paris. But by now, the French capital was firmly under Nazi occupation. The Duke's solution was breathtakingly simple. He requested papers for the maid's passage from the Gestapo. When you think what was going on, this was just after Dunkirk, that they should actually be in contact with the enemy in order to retrieve their belongings from their house, it, it's extraordinary. In 1940, the Luftwaffe had begun their first raids on British shipping. It was now that Edward showed his true colours. Remarkably, he advised his pro-Nazi hosts that the bombing of Britain would force her to accept Hitler's ultimatums. Edward the peace broker now turned warmonger. This extraordinary message was passed on to Berlin by the German ambassador in Lisbon, Heunigen Heuner. Edward is waiting for a turn of events favorable to him. He is convinced that if he had remained on the throne, war would have been avoided. And he characterizes himself as a firm supporter of a peaceful arrangement with Germany. The Duke believes with certainty that continued heavy bombing will make England ready for peace. He was suggesting that prolonged bombing of England would almost certainly bring about peace, which is an almost incredible thing for an Englishman to say, which would mean the deaths of, all his fellow, of so many of his fellow countrymen. And it also was a particularly dangerous moment for the British government for him to be taking this line, because there was a certain pro-peace party in Britain at that time. 
Ribbentrop had a new plan to reassert control over Edward and get him back to Spain. An elaborate scheme was hatched to invite the Duke and Duchess on a hunting trip near the Spanish border and from there to secretly cross the frontier. They would then take refuge at a castle in Spain. The German plan was that once there, Edward would publicly reject English policy and sever ties with his brother, the king. The owner of the castle in Spain was the Count of Montaco. He was ordered to make it available to the Windsors, from where Edward would make this devastating announcement. El, el duque iba a hacer una, un manifiesto, iba a publicar un manifiesto de, desde mi casa en favor de la paz. Esto a mí la verdad es que tampoco me gustó porque para, para mí entrañaba una, una traición a, un, a Inglaterra que estaba que estaba en esos momentos luchando desesperadamente y luego además porque realmente consideraba que esta que esta esta actitud del, del duque de Windsor se contradecía con lo que podía ser el sentido de un ex rey respecto a su país. Edward was under increasing scrutiny. The villa was surrounded by a variety of shadowy agents and informers. Ribbentrop decided the best way to ensure that Edward returned to Spain was to make him too scared to stay in Portugal. His agents smashed the windows of the villa. Certainly, he succeeded in intimidating the Duke. Angel de Velasco, a Spanish agent working for the Germans, was sent to the villa to bring the Duke back to Spain. El Duque, pues, el hombre estaba temblando. Prácticamente, había momentos en los que no sabía lo que decía. Vamos, sí sabía lo que decía y lo que quería decir, pero que no acertaba a decir las cosas bien. Por eso, cuando se me pregunta qué opinión tiene usted de aquella entrevista, pues la opinión es eso de un hombre que está aturdido, que está eh, temblando y que no sabe qué es lo que va a pasar un momento más tarde. Churchill stepped in and sent Walter Monckton, a close friend of the Duke, to Lisbon with a letter which contained a careful warning. Many sharp and unfriendly ears will be pricked up to catch any suggestion that your Royal Highness takes a view about the war, or about the Germans, or about Hitlerism, which is different from that adopted by the British nation and Parliament. It's possible, in my judgment, that there was some particular piece of information that Monckton made it clear to the Duke, perhaps in a rather unsporting way, that Churchill had got hold of, maybe about the Duchess and her past, that will be made public, that might destroy his uh, and her reputation. And I think that something like that has to explain why the Duke suddenly, within the space of only a matter of hours, changed his mind and decided that he wasn't going to accept the German offer. The message that Monckton brought was that Edward should take up an appointment as governor of the Bahamas with immediate effect. With the threat of a court-martial still in the air, Edward realized he had no alternative but to leave Lisbon. For someone of his rank, a governorship in the far reaches of the empire was a humiliating rejection. But still, the Germans held out the hope that Edward would change his mind. His host, Ricardo Espirito Santo, desperately encouraged Edward not to give up on the German plans for a negotiated peace. The Portuguese banker finally revealed the identity of his real masters. The intermediary this time specifically referred that he had authority from Berlin. And the Duke, interestingly enough, did not say, no, leave, this is treachery. He actually paid tribute to Hitler's desire for peace and said that he couldn't disobey the orders that he had been given which, and I quote here, would disclose his intentions prematurely. Now, this suggests he had a long-term strategy, 
which he saw he might still be able to operate from the Bahamas. Before he left, Edward told Espirito Santo that he could return from the Bahamas at a moment's notice. According to German documents of the time, they even arranged a code word by which he could be recalled. I think Edward thought that Britain was going to lose the war. And I think in that case that he wanted to be in an advantageous position should there be any question of him returning to England. Uh, so he wanted to be there and he wanted to be in touch. On August the 1st, 1940, the Duke and Duchess left Lisbon for the Bahamas on the steamship Excalibur. On the same day that they set sail, Hitler gave the order for the mass bombing of Britain. was about to discover that the British government would not be forced to the negotiating table by such naked aggression. Nor would the severe bombing of London persuade his brother, King George VI, to abdicate. Their Majesties have continued to tour the districts that have suffered most damage in recent raids, and the knowledge that their King and Queen are among them, they were actually caught in a raid and had to take shelter during this particular visit, has greatly heartened the people. Their Majesties were tremendously impressed by their steady courage. steamer drops anchor in the harbor where hundreds of islanders gather to welcome the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. While the Battle of Britain raged in the summer of 1940, Edward left Lisbon to take up his position as governor of the Bahamas. The Duke and Duchess arrived in the capital, Nassau, to a welcome fit for an ex-king. On the surface, everything was fine, but behind the show of public duty, Edward knew that the British government and his brother, King George VI, had clipped his wings. He had been sent into political exile again. He didn't even pretend to hide his disappointment at his first press conference. While Great Britain has employed me in this role in the past, I very much doubt that the British government has it in mind at the present that my official activities should extend beyond the confines of the Bahamar Islands. Wallace was equally unhappy. She derided her new posting. Writing to her Aunt Bessie, she said, I really do wish we could move somewhere inhabited, at least by our own class. These awful people day in and day out. Nassau is a moron paradise. But Churchill could not have anticipated that even at this far remove, there would be dangerous Nazi sympathizers who could influence the Windsors. The Bahamas were home to their old friend, Axel Wenner-Gren, the international arms dealer and supporter of the Third Reich. The Swedish millionaire was eagerly awaiting the couple's arrival. He had received a secret cable about them from German intelligence. You will soon find there 
a new and interesting family with whom I assume you will at once become friendly. That family have a sympathetic understanding for totalitarian ideas. They should be of great significance for forthcoming development of events. One of the wealthiest men in the world, Werner Gren had played a key role in planning Edward's initiative for appeasement and tour of Germany in 1937. Werner Gren now set about using the Duke again. He invited the couple on a cruise to Miami on his yacht, the Southern Cross. Still the most famous couple in the world, thousands of Americans lined the streets to welcome them. As the newsreels recorded the public adulation, Winston Churchill was horrified by Edward's intimacy with Venner Gren. This gentleman is, according to reports I have received, regarded as a pro-German international financier with strong leanings towards appeasement and suspected of being in communication with the enemy. Again, Edward ignored Churchill's warnings and continued to involve himself in improbable schemes for peace with Hitler. On his return to Nassau, Edward offered a well-known American newspaper journalist, Fulton Ausler, an exclusive interview. Ausler was a personal friend of the American president, Franklin Roosevelt. His papers are held here at the University of Georgetown in Washington. Although Fulton Ausler died in 1952, his son agreed to reveal to us the contents of his father's diaries for the first time. These papers held, I think, one of the great secrets of uh, uh, World War II uh, before our entry into the war. Uh, and it was a, uh, a secret that uh, somewhat terrified my father at the time. In the, in the notes, he, he declares that he fears for his life. On December the 19th, 1940, Fulton Asler was summoned to see the Duke here at Government House in Nassau. Addressing themselves to the issue of whether America should get involved in the war, Arsler was astounded by the Duke's position. There was some talk in America that uh, there might be revolution in Germany. And I'll quote again at the, uh, about the Duke's reaction to that. Uh, he said, there was too much wishful thinking and that there would be no revolution in Germany. It would be a tragic thing for the world if Hitler were overthrown. Hitler, he said, was the right and logical leader of the German people. He said, it was unfortunate that I had never met his Hitler. And he regarded Hitler as a great man. What, what was your father's reaction at this point? <laughs> well, he wrote very specifically. He said, quote, I was beginning to feel dazed. For the first time in my life, it was literally true that I did not believe my ears. The Duke did more than just praise Hitler. He was again attempting to influence the tide of political events, and specifically stop America's armed intervention in the war on the side of the Allies. It became clear to Ausler why he had been granted this exclusive interview. There was a silence. Suddenly, Windsor leaned forward, shooting his head out like a turtle and bent almost double in his chair. And he looked around at me and he said, do you suppose that your president would consider intervening as a mediator when, as, and if the proper time arrives? Tell Mr. Roosevelt that if he will make an offer of intervention for peace, that before anyone in England can oppose it, the Duke of Windsor will instantly issue a statement supporting it, and that will start a revolution in England and force peace. Reeling from the shock of what he had heard, the journalist returned to his hotel to tell his wife what had happened. 
I literally took my wife into a closet and closed the door and told her what had happened. It was at once apparent that she thought I had taken leave of my senses, my wits, and I did not believe my own words as I told her what had happened. What's more, I told her that I had the uneasy suspicion that what the Duke of Windsor really wanted was for me to convey these almost treasonable sentiments to President Roosevelt. On his return to the United States, Ursula immediately arranged to see the president. That was an absolutely remarkable uh, meeting. Undoubtedly the most uh, remarkable that uh, my father ever had with the president. And Fulton, he said, nothing uh, can surprise me uh, these days. Nothing will seem too fantastic. Why, do you know, he went on earnestly, but with a very cunning, uh, cousining smile, why do you know that I am amazed to find that some of the greatest people in the British Empire, men of the so-called upper classes, men of the highest rank, secretly want to appease Hitler and stop the war. End quote. My father wrote then, I gasped. <laughs> it was perfectly apparent that agents of the colonial secretary had been listening to what the Duke had said. Ausler's interview with Edward was eventually published in the American magazine Liberty in March 1941. Although the article was heavily censored, Edward was still quoted as predicting a new world order in Europe imposed by Germany. His comments caused widespread outrage within the British establishment. Although Churchill had been aware of the interview for months, it was only now that he angrily rebuked Edward. The language, whatever was meant, will certainly be interpreted as defeatist and pro-Nazi, and by implication approving of isolationism to keep America out of the war. Any lingering hopes that Edward might have had of stopping the war were smashed completely in December 1941, when the Japanese attacked the American fleet in Pearl Harbor. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Four days later, America joined the Allies against Germany. Edward's plans to prevent their intervention lay in ruins. But worse was yet to come for the couple. Their old friend, Axel Wenner-Gren, was now listed as a wanted man by the FBI and was forced to flee the Bahamas for Mexico. Despite this, Edward and the Duchess sent him a message of support. We are so sorry to hear you are not returning, but hope you will have a pleasant time in Mexico. Wallace and Edward Windsor. In Mexico, the FBI put Axel Wenner-Gren under surveillance. They not only suspected him of spying for the Nazis, but also of running an illegal currency operation through his bank there. Leif Leifland has studied the personal diaries of Wenner-Gren and written a biography of the Swedish millionaire. Well, there was a standing instruction from Washington to the American ambassador an embassy in Mexico City to um, follow Axel Wenner's steps very closely. Uh, in the embassy there was a FBI uh, um, organization and they had through some agreement with the Mexican government uh, access to all information to all Axel Wenner's financial transactions in, in Mexico City. So if Axel Wenner went to the bank and, and deposited ten dollars the FBI agents at the American Embassy in Mexico City would know it the following day. 
Again, Edward was to become implicated. This time in Venegren's illegal financial transactions. During the war, any exchange of more than 10 pounds into a foreign currency was regarded as a serious economic crime. Edward seems to have ignored this. His currency speculation is reported in FBI files at the time. One report was sent in June 1942. It is understood that deposits of two and a half million dollars were made in the Bahamas at the express request and in part for the benefit of the Duke of Windsor. Further confirmation of Edward's involvement comes from an old acquaintance of the Duke and Duchess, Alfred de Marigny. He frequently socialized with both Edward and Van Agren and noted the high regard in which Edward held the Swedish millionaire. Oh, the Duke was very impressed. He was always very impressed by people who were successful or had money. He was certainly involved because he was always with them. And he, uh, all the money that he, he, he was paid in, in pounds, and he would transfer them into dollars out of the country. All exchange of money was illegal. You, had, you could not change dollars into pounds or pounds into dollars. Especially into pounds, that was the end of it. If you were going to take pounds and make dollars out of that, Oh, they put you in jail. It was, it was a crime. And so we say farewell to Dixie and travel to the Bahamas to see the Duke and Duchess of Windsor refereeing a charity golf match. The full story of the Duke's currency fiddling while governor of the Bahamas has been covered up. It was too serious a crime in wartime for the royal family to be smeared with this sort of scandal. News reports preferred to stick to Edward's appearances at charity golf matches. Thanks, Governor. Edward was always obsessed with money, and I think that when he abdicated, it made him feel very insecure. Although he was, in actual fact, a very rich man, and had saved a great deal of money when he was Prince of Wales, something like a million pounds, which in today's terms is a great deal of money. He went on feeling insecure, and he felt very bitter against his brother for not giving him enough money. Startling evidence has recently emerged that Edward continued his currency speculation after the war. By then, the couple had settled back in France. Only last year, proof of Edward's illegal activities emerged in the papers of the late Sir Walter Monckton, who had been Edward's lawyer and a close personal friend. The discovery was made by author Andrew Roberts. The Duke of Windsor was involved in extremely long term and large-scale illegal currency transactions in the 50s and the late 40s. These were done personally and uh, over the telephone by him. He was um, selling sterling for francs against the laws of both Britain and France and he was doing that over a very long period, 10 years, and making a very large amount of money, 200,000 pounds in those days, about two and a half million pounds today. Edward was making these staggering amounts of money at a time when he had a substantial and tax-free income from the British government. The couple had also been given this house in the Bois de Boulogne by the French government, where they lived in the style to which they had become accustomed. Neither the French or British authorities censured Edward's criminal activities, even though some of his associates were imprisoned for the same crime. There was a classic establishment cover-up. Sir Walter Monckton, the Duke's lawyer, was involved in protecting the Duke's reputation. He went to all the people involved, except, of course, the French, who were still kept in the dark about this, and um, made sure that nothing was said about it in public. Details of the Duke's financial dealings and his wartime collusion with Nazi Germany were covered up. In the aftermath of the war, no scandal would be allowed to surface which could damage the institution of monarchy. But the establishment was forced to go to amazing lengths to protect itself in the years to come. The 20,000-ton American troop ship Argentina, as I saw her anchored in Plymouth Sound, within sight of the shores of Britain. 
Aboard her were the Duke and Duchess of Windsor on their way to France. The Duke has come After the end of the war, the prodigal Duke was anxious to settle back in England. But again, he raised the issue of his wife's rank and title with his brother. Again, the king denied him and refused Edward's request for a position of influence. The couple sailed on to France. While his family refused to even meet his wife, there was no end to the royal feud in sight. Till then, au revoir. I think that George VI always had at the back of his mind, although the royal family was at its most popular, possibly then, and he was worried that anything might upset the esteem in which they were held. And therefore, he was not particularly keen on the public learning of the Duke of Windsor's contacts with the Nazis. The potential for embarrassment was enormous. The conspiracy of silence about Edward's past now became an active conspiracy to conceal. Incredibly, the man the royal family turned to for help in their cleaning up operation was one of the most notorious spies Britain has ever known, Anthony Blunt. In 1979, Blunt was publicly unmasked as a Soviet agent. During the war, he'd been a serving member of MI5. A distant relative of the Queen, for many years, Blunt was a highly effective double agent operating in the heart of the British establishment. This was a case of political conscience against loyalty to country. I chose conscience. In July 1945, Blunt was sent to Germany on the pretext of retrieving a series of Queen Victoria's letters, which were stored here at Kronberg Castle. It was owned by Philip of Hesse, a senior Nazi officer and Edward's cousin. After the war, it was used as a social club by British and American officers. There are those who are convinced incriminating documents about Edward's past were held there, including a record of his meeting with Hitler, and that Blunt's real purpose was to retrieve them. Writer Colin Simpson interviewed Blunt in 1979 and asked him for an explanation of his mission to Germany. I asked him what the devil he'd been doing in Kronberg Castle. And he said the household, by which he meant the royal household, had asked him to discover some archives which they were concerned might fall into the wrong hands. And I assumed the American hands. Blunt and his party were in a bit of a quandary. They had the Germans' permission to take the papers, the family's permission. Uh, technically, they were on American-occupied soil. The papers were guarded by an American lady officer who had obviously realized they had considerable value. Uh, Blunt and his party reckoned that possession would be nine points of the law, and when the lady officer went away to answer the telephone, they whisked the two crates out of the attic, down the stairs, onto a truck, and away into the night. If Anthony Blunt's sole purpose was to collect Queen Victoria's letters, why was such an elaborate subterfuge necessary? The royal family has consistently denied that there were any documents later than the Victorian period found at Kronberg. But we can reveal that there is now evidence of personal correspondence signed by Edward being stored there and dated many years later. Two days after Anthony Blunt arrived at Kronberg, Douglas Price also visited the castle. He is one of the few people alive today who can shed any light on this mystery. He recorded his memories of that day in his diary. In many respects, I thought that the place you know, I recorded is more English than German. English royal arms are everywhere, and so too are English portraits, <coughs> including a very flattering one of Victoria herself in middle in later life. But most interesting to me at the time was the library. Um, 
although it alone of all the house was in chaos and all the furniture being piled up and thrown about and yet its contents were at a first glance most valuable although douglas price was unaware that anthony blunt was in the castle it was apparent that someone had recently searched the library even though it was over 50 years ago price clearly remembers seeing a remarkable set of documents some of which he's convinced bore edward's signature it was a particular piece of furniture which first caught his eye there was the one um, custom-built cabinet, very elegant cabinet, with glass drawers in it, which contained a lot of the typescript um, correspondence, or copies of correspondence, between uh, the then Prince of Hesse. And uh, I think though it was um, uh, the Prince Edward the later, the Prince of Wales, as he then was. The rumors persist that these were the real documents Blunt was sent to get. Certainly, the conspiracy to conceal the true nature of his mission intensified. In 1964, Blunt was identified as a spy in a secret MI5 investigation. The Queen's secretary, Michael Ledeen, expressly forbade his interrogators to ask questions relating to Blunt's activities in Germany. From time to time, you may find Blunt referring to an assignment he undertook on behalf of the palace, a visit to Germany at the end of the war. Please do not pursue this matter. Strictly speaking, it is not relevant to considerations of national security. Blunt's chief interrogator was Peter Wright. In his famous memoirs, Spy Catcher, Wright recalled the royal edict and concluded, The palace has had several centuries to learn the difficult art of scandal burying. As so often, the truth about Edward is buried. Most documents relating to the monarchy are held under lock and key, here at Windsor Castle. Unlike public records, which can usually be released after 30 years, documents about the royal family cannot be published for 100 years. The Queen Mother particularly regarded herself as the guardian of the family image, and she didn't want to see these things coming to light. Although she intensely disliked the Duke of Windsor and they all um, showed him up in a bad way, she nonetheless thought it important that they should be suppressed if possible. Ever since the war, there have been rumors about the Duke of Windsor's wartime treachery. Successive governments, both Labour and Conservative, have suppressed documents relating to Edward and closed ranks to protect the institution of the monarchy. Even today, over 20 years after Edward's death, there are scores of documents here in the public records office which remain closed. We do not have access to the secret archives of the British intelligence services, particularly in this case MI6, because this is where a lot of the confirmatory material on Windsor must lie. And it seems outrageous to me that all the parties are dead, that we can't know what was really going on at this time. The British establishment even tried to influence the publication of a foreign government's records. Churchill wanted any German documents relating to Edward destroyed, rather than release details of his treasonable behavior. Although these foreign policy documents were used as vital evidence in the Nuremberg trials, Churchill dismissed them as a tainted source. Churchill was a tremendous monarchist. And I think that he felt that the reputation of the royal family would be damaged by these revelations. And strenuous efforts were made to first have them destroyed and then delay publication. So there was always this embarrassment about him. And then it, later on, there was the discovery that he'd been involved in dealings in French francs on the black market foreign currency. 
So there were always these nasty little facts lurking about. In 1957, when the German foreign policy documents were finally published in an English edition, they revealed many clues to Edward's complicity with Nazi Germany. The British Foreign Office was sufficiently concerned that they insisted on an extraordinary disclaimer to preface the volumes which mentioned Edward. His Royal Highness never wavered in his loyalty to the British cause. Edward himself issued a statement dismissing the German documents as complete fabrications and gross distortions of the truth. Her eldest son, the Duke of Windsor, here with the Duchess, for whom he gave up the throne, was now joined by his brother, the Duke of Gloucester, to pay tribute to their mother at the ceremony of unveiling. No explanation as to why the German documents should be discredited has ever emerged. Nor do we know why the royal family refused to formally acknowledge Edward for over 30 years. At an unveiling ceremony to commemorate Edward's mother, Queen Mary, the family met Wallace Simpson for the first time since 1936. The public show of unity guaranteed that the private scandals would never be revealed. Edward died in 1972, with most of his secrets intact. There is enough evidence to prove his wartime treachery and to raise serious doubts about his loyalty to the British people. Many will remember him as the black sheep of a family who never quite forgave him for his unfortunate liaison with Mrs. Simpson. But the truth may be more damning, that Edward should have been charged with treason, or at very least, in acting against the interests of his king and country. Next week, we begin a season of Sunday stereo specials with this year's last night of the proms. Join us for a wonderful night of music and colourful antics from London's Royal Albert Hall next Sunday night at 8.30. Coming up, Compass.